To squash or stretch a stationary object, you normally need to apply two forces that push or pull an object. For example, with this ball here, if you just apply one force from the side, you can change the motion of the object and cause it to move. However, if you wanted to squash that object, you'd need to apply a force from either side which would then allow you to squash and deform the object. The same applies to stretching. To stretch a spring, you need to apply two forces that pull either end of the spring. So here we have a spring connected to a clamp stand and at the moment we're not stretching that spring. However, if we apply a force to the other end of the spring as well, we will be able to stretch our spring. Because of this connection here, we will have a tension force upwards and we've got weight acting downwards, pulling the spring, allowing it to be stretched. Elastic objects return to their original shape after being stretched. So for example, with this spring, if we were to apply masses to the end of the spring and stretch it, the spring would be considered elastic if once you remove that pull force that's stretching the spring, it would return to its original shape. Inelastic objects are the opposite to elastic objects. They don't return to their original shape after being stretched. So that's any object that you can stretch, but it won't return to the shape that it started in. For example, blue tack. If you were to stretch blue tack and let go, it wouldn't automatically return to its original shape. Some elastic objects, like springs, obey Hooke's law. Hooke's law states that when you double the force applied to an object, the extension of the object also doubles. You can do an experiment to investigate the relationship of force applied and extension of a spring to see if it obeys Hooke's law. You would attach a spring to a clamp stand, attach a ruler to a second clamp stand and place next to the spring. And then you would measure the original length of the spring. You would then attach a mass hook to the spring and this has a weight of 0.1 newtons. Now it depends on what mass hook that you are using, but if we used a mass hook that was 10 grams, that would be equal to 0.1 newtons. So this is the example I'm using in this experiment. You might use a slightly different mass hook and different masses, but this is one that you would often use in class. You would then measure the new length of the spring. Now that we've applied this force of 0.1 newtons pulling the spring downwards. You would then subtract the original length of the spring to calculate the extension of the spring. You then re repeat steps 4 to 6 for the following weights 0.2 newtons, 0.4 newtons, 0.6 newtons, 0.8 newtons and 1 newton for example by adding the correct number of masses to the mass hook. Again it depends on the masses that you're using. I'm here assuming that each of these masses we add to the hook has a mass of 10 grams which has a weight which is the force of 0.1 newtons. So here altogether we have one mass attached to the mass hook. So the mass hook itself was 0.1 newtons and the mass on top is 0.1 newtons. So altogether this is how we'd get our pull force of 0.2 newtons. Record your results in a table of force, which is the weight that you are pulling down on the spring against extension which you're going to calculate, as we said, by calculating the length of the spring, but subtracting the original length. Then you're going to draw a graph of your results. So the variables for this experiment, the independent variable is the thing that we are changing. We are changing the force applied. And we're doing this by changing the weight that we're adding in Newton. So we're changing the weight we are applying to the end of the spring. Our dependent variable is the extension of the spring and 
And a really important control variable is that we use the same type of spring. Because if you use springs made up of different metals, then they might be more stiff or more stretchy than others. Now for this graph, it's often plotted with force along the y-axis and extension along the x-axis, but don't worry at all if you plot it the other way around. So when an object is obeying Hooke's law, a graph of force against extension will show a straight line that goes through zero. And if it obeys Hooke's law, what this should show is that when you double the force, so when you go from one and double it to two, the extension should also double. So when the force is one newtons, the extension was two. When you double the force, so now it's two newtons, the extension also doubles. If you double the force again, so we start at two, that would be our four newtons over here. And you can see the extension was four, but now it's doubled to eight. So at this point here, our spring is obeying Hooke's law. If the object is overstretched, it will lose its elastic properties and the graph curves off. At this point, it's gone beyond its elastic limit and no longer obeys Hooke's law. Hi guys, if you enjoyed that last video, then please click on the screen to subscribe. You can also find all my videos in one place at gccrevisionmonkey.com. If you're a teacher, check out the Key Stage 3 package at sciencesurgery.com. It contains all of the Revision Monkey videos as well as loads more Key Stage 3 resources.